like to uh, thank everybody for joining the uh, Levin Ginsburg webinar for um, November 10th, 2021. Um, the topic for today is the Trademark Modernization Act, uh, which uh, will be uh, implemented uh, in December of 2021 and fully. I'll be talking about that in a little more detail. Like to thank everybody for attending. Um, I will be trying to record this and um, uh, distributing the recording later for those uh, who could not attend. Um, the topic for today, and we'll cover the next 30 minutes, is the Trademark Modernization Act, uh, which has a couple new ex parte processes available for um, uh, the um, expungement and uh, re-examination of uh, trademarks, expanded letters of protest, so, uh, there's a new ground for cancellation, and some shorter times for responses to office actions. And I'll just talk a little bit about if we have some time at the end about some of the procedural changes that have happened already in 2021 and some more that are becoming in 2022. But just in general, the uh, Trademark Modernization Act is a public law uh, that was enacted as part of an appropriations bill, um, a sort of um, rather than a uh, separate act um, on its own, but it basically um, was enacted on December 27th, 2020 and signed. Um, some parts of it were took effect immediately, but much of it is going to be fully implemented by December 27th, 2021. And some specific elements uh, will be delayed uh, until um, the um, June of 2022, which I'll be talking about in more detail. The per part that was already took effect as of December 27, 2020, was um, a statutory presumption of irreparable harm upon a violation of the Lanham Act. Uh, there used to be a circuit split on the standard for injunctive relief in trademark infringement cases. Uh, following the ruling uh, from 2006 in eBay versus Merck Exchange. Um, the eBay eliminated a similar presumption of irreparable harm in patent cases. Um, and um, basically the, this it makes it a lot easier if a um, uh, somebody's coming in trying to get injunctive relief uh, for violation of a uh, or infringement of a trademark. Um, it, this is a, a good thing. One minor point I wanted to talk about is some expanded letters of protest. Um, letters of protest is a, a procedure by which uh, you can let an examiner know of uh, particular things that they should know about, such as uh, prior registrations or if um, a mark is actually a, a generic industry term, uh, things like that. Um, uh, but now it's it's much more expansive. Uh, essentially, now any grounds for opposition or cancellation can now be the subject of letter or protest, and uh, the trademark office plans uh, to keep the the normal fee of fifty dollars uh, to file it. Essentially, what you do is you file the letter, uh, and if the um, uh, the director's office believes that what you've said has merit, uh, then they let the examiner know of, about the evidence that you've you provided. Uh, there now is an additional grounds for cancellation. Um, after the mark has been used for three years, uh, the additional grounds for cancellation of the mark has never been used in U U.S. commerce. Uh, what had been there before uh, was a, um, you, you could still always cancel if the mark uh, had uh, been in use and, you know, was no longer in use. Um, but but this is explicitly a ground that the mark has never been in use in U.S. commerce. Uh, so first, now we're going to be talking about the the two ex parte uh, proceedings. Uh, the first is called ex parte expungement of registrations. Um, basically, what this is, it's a petition that can be filed in whole or in part after three years of registration when there are specific goods listed in the registration for which the trademark has never been in use in U.S. commerce. 
uh, the person making the petition is merely required to supply evidence of a reasonable investigation showing that the register mark was never used for the goods or services identified in the petition. And the registrant can respond with evidence of use or a reasonable explanation as to why the goods or services are actually not in use. So breaking that down, um, this is a, a new type of proceeding. It is uh, a petition that's filed uh, with the director's office. Um, and the proceeding must be requested within three to 10 years after the registration date. However, uh, from three years from implementation of the act, uh, a proceeding may be requested uh, for any registration at least three years old, regardless of the 10 year limit. Um, the question uh, comes up is what exactly is a reasonable investigation? Uh, the uh, office is quite clear that it can't just be a simple Google search. You've got to uh, provide, um, you know, actual evidence, but at the same time, you're not required to hire like a formal uh, investigator. You you don't have to do a, do like a paid search. Um, but if you do a search on your own and you provide state and federal trademark records showing um, that uh, this has never been in use, um, evidence from uh, the internet websites or other media which are likely or believed to be owned by the registrant, internal websites or our other online media, print sources, um, any actual filings made with the state or federal business registration or reg regulatory agencies, um, uh, ev looking into the actual marketplace activities, such as if you have evidence of contacting uh, the uh, the registrants and they said, oh, no, we're not using that, uh, that, that, that would be good evidence. Um, and then any other reasonable accessible source with information. So essentially what you do is uh, you provide uh, this uh, to the director's office and they review it and see whether or not you've made a prima facie case uh, for um, uh, the expungement. Um, the second one is called ex parte re-examination, uh, which is a whole different um, proceeding. And basically what that is, it's a petition that's uh, filed within five years of registration. Um, and once again, the petitioner must have made a reasonable as big investigation into the registrant's use. And it points again to particular dates that were there in the application process, such as uh, the uh, date of first use that was alleged either in the actual filing or in um, like, a, like an amendment to alleged use. And if you have actual evidence that that particular mark was not used for all the goods or for some of the goods as of the date, uh, the mark can be re-examined within the first five years. Um, the reason for this essentially comes from a lot of filings that have been made from foreign jurisdictions. Uh, the ones that are in the media lot is there's a lot of filings that have come from China in the last few years uh, where there's a lot of um, digitally altered specimens uh, such that uh, there's a, a common uh, image that's used across from uh, from file to file and just uh, the actual mark that's being used is is uh, uh, changed and edited uh, using the uh, editing like a like Photoshop and um, so th this this is essentially the reason is for that although I, I do believe that these can be used for all sorts of, of filings especially against uh, Madrid applications uh, which are, if once they're registered in the US, uh, there is no use requirement for the first few years, um, but uh, they could also, uh, you know, be uh, subject to this. Also filings based on a foreign registration, uh, no use is required initially. Um, again, um, uh, that may be more come up for the, the first, ex the expungement. Um, so the fee is proposed currently to be $600 per class. The trademark office is defining the final rules, uh, which should be out shortly 
uh, they're not out yet, but the proposed rules are, are, are out and they, they're currently set at $600 per class. Um, so for this re-examination procedure, again, as I said, it, it's, it's uh, the relevant date that this has to be of is of certain sworn statements that are filed during the application process. So first off is if the application was filed based on use, uh, the filing date for the application. Uh, second would be the filing date for an amendment claiming that the mark was actually in use in U.S. commerce. And the third is uh, if you filed based on intent to use the deadline by which a statement of use was due to be filed. So those are all points in the application process in which sworn statements are required uh, to be there. Um, and so again, this is a re-examination. Uh, basically, if you can come forward with evidence uh, that uh, the mark hasn't been used at any one of those points, um, you know, during the first five years, then uh, the exam the office will look into uh, that evidence. Um, now, the director can also institute uh, proceedings without a petition if the director discovers information that supports a prima facie case that the trademark has never been used for certain goods or services, or not been used as of the particular relevant data to particular goods or services. Um, I anticipate this coming up more often. The, the director might institute it uh, if they are able to determine the source uh, for a lot of these uh, foreign filings. And if they're able to track it down to a particular person, uh, they, they probably would re-examine all of the, the filings that, that that particular person had made uh, during the, the course. Um, I should say that there are a lot of uh, changes that are coming uh, to the uh, the process to sort of uh, tighten it down as to who can actually file documents uh, with the, with the trademark office. Uh, those are uh, sort of a separate proposal uh, that's coming. Uh, but basically, they're, they're they've already implemented such that you've you've got to register and have an account with your my my USPTO account to to file documents. Uh, but um, the you know, the issue there uh, is that they're going to make it a little tighter, uh, make it uh, a little uh, more uh, user based. Uh, so essentially the procedure for both of these um, is uh, once you, you pay your fee and the director believes that there's evidence, the examiner will issue an office action alerting the registrant to the, the proceeding. The registrant has two months to respond to the proceeding. And it, like if you're able to provide evidence that was actually in use or, um, you know, at those particular points, if it's a reexamination or uh, that it actually had been in use uh, or potentially even excusable non use uh, in cer certain cases. Um, then the USPTO makes the determination of the facts and the registrant has two months to respond uh, to request either reconsideration or file an appeal with the trademark trial and appeal board. So as a, just going forward, I think uh, what, what, what this requires us as practitioners to do is we must carefully examine uh, and confirm that the goods are in use for all the goods or services listed, uh, because an, even an inadvertent misstatement could could result in uh, cancellation if we're wrong as to a date that's alleged. Um, so that's that's going to be important uh, during the examination process, um, and also as regarding one other change that happened this last year. Um, I think uh, that'll be important as well. Um, and especially now all for foreign filers, uh, they, they should be very careful um, to monitor their portfolio of registrations in the US and figure out which ones of them might be vulnerable for cancellation. Um, because this, this option uh, for filing a procedure uh, through the director's office is much, much cheaper than a filing through the trademark trial and appeal board would be. Uh, if you file a cancellation for non-use through the TTAB um, and it's defended, you mean you could, you know, spend, you know, 10, 20, 30, $40,000 easily uh, 
before uh, you come to a resolution. Uh, whereas this merely the the petitioner files, uh, they pay six hundred dollars. I don't know, depending on uh, what what kind of evidence that they, they come up with, so whatever their time is to put that together, but that they pay that and then they're out of the process. Everything then is, is done by the by the office. So I expect these types of proceedings to be much more common uh, against uh, registrations that are either based on uh, like a foreign registration basis or on uh, like Madrid uh, 66A. Another rule that's uh, going to be coming into effect uh, is uh, the shortened office action response times. Uh, the, right now, there's a little bit of a difference between what the Trademark Modernization Act allows and what the proposed rules say. Um, basically, the act says that the examiner can require at their discretion shortened response times from two to six months. And then if needed, the applicant can request additional time to respond. Now, the current proposal from the, term, the trademark office uh, is to allow for a three month response period for all office actions, except for Madrid cases. With a single extension of three months available for payment of a fee of $125. So essentially what this would mean is uh, if for all office actions apart from Madrid, uh, under this proposal, they would um, be due within three months, and if you before that end of three months, you could file an extension uh, for by paying $125 to get an additional three months to respond. Um, the implementation of that has actually been delayed by the trademark office uh, until June 27th, 2022, uh, to allow uh, practitioners and software providers to come up with uh, methods of um getting um people to um uh, to implement this in their software um and so that's that's been currently delayed there are some alternative proposals that have been made by the trademark office as well uh we'll have to see what actually gets implemented in the final rule which is expected shortly And then I just wanted to talk briefly about some other changes uh, that have taken place in the last few years uh, that I think people should be aware of. Um, there was an updated fee schedule which implemented on January 1st of 2021. Uh, there's what's included in there is sort of a, a, a an amendment to the ongoing uh, a procedure involving audits. Um, so, for example, uh, the, the trademark office does a lot of audits if you're filing Section 8 and 15s or renewals. Um, and uh, it's supposed to be random, uh, but what ends up happening in my experience is if your your client has a lot of goods or services uh, in the in the recitation, you're much more likely to have received an audit uh, to you know, see whether or not the mark's actually in use on all the goods. And so uh, if any goods need to be deleted after filing, but before acceptance. Uh, so if you if an audit is is issued and you actually have to delete the goods that are subject to the audit, uh, the fee now is two hundred and fifty dollars per class, uh, which can add up. And again, this. Uh, uh, is a practitioner's point uh, something to counsel clients on uh, if you are uh, handling a, a renewal or other maintenance filing uh, is to make sure the mark is actually in use and all the goods or services and to sort of proactively uh, deal with uh, the um, Um, you know, the potential for an audit, so it's stave it off. And the other change coming in January 1st, uh, a new edition of the NIST classification system. Uh, currently, the 11th edition, which will take effect. Uh, so the ID manual that's currently accessible from uh, USPTO.gov will be updated to reflect those changes. And that's part of uh, sort of the ongoing process and maintenance of that. Uh, of that database. 
So uh, without further ado, I think I, what I'll do is turn this over to you folks for questions. Uh, so if anybody has any, you can uh, submit them through the chat. Otherwise, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Uh, the, um, the recording will be distributed later, and um, I'd like to encourage everyone to attend our future webinars, uh, which are likely to be quarterly. And if there's no further questions, I will go ahead and end the webinar. So thank you so much.